Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. Look here, y'all. We got a problem. We got a problem. One of the guys, you know, uh, this got to the compound. Uh, we had no idea who he was. You know, when somebody new comes to the compound, you got to do a background check so you know who you're getting, what you're getting, and what's going on with them and how they were in, uh, able to function on the compound or outside the compound if they just come from the streets how they were able to get along with the folks, and if they were even, in fact, the folks, right? So we had this one brother to come to the compound. Oh, my God, he had us fooled. I'm talking about he had us fooled, man. I fell for it. I thought this brother was top-notch, A1, the real deal, holy field. But he showed us, man, he showed us. He almost cost us everything, and it was almost to the point to where, you know, like we were ready to crash out on another organization that hadn't done a thing to us. And if we would have crashed out, we'd have probably got slaughtered because we didn't have anything to go to war with. And I'm gonna explain that to you in this episode, right? I'm gonna call this episode Crazy Folks, right? I want y'all to really pay attention to this one because this is a doozy, right? So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Check it out, y'all. Check it out. This story here, right, is one of those, man, where it's like I had to do a double take. When I got to thinking about it, I was talking to one of the guys here on the compound, right? You know, I'm not in rotation anymore, but I was talking to one of the guys, and he had asked me, did I know this particular brother? I'm like, yeah, I know that brother. That brother did this and that and that and this, right? And almost caused a lot of problems for the business, right, back in the day, right? And he was like, yeah, man, uh, uh, he did some stuff here and there, whatever. So it got me to thinking about back in the day when this brother came to the compound I was there when I was still in rotation. Like I say, when a person comes to the compound, you have to do a background check, right? If they come from another prison, uh, you want to write back to that prison. Back in the day, you didn't have phones and all that kind of stuff. So you had to write back to the other prison uh, and ask them, was this brother on county? Is he in good standing? All of that kind of stuff, just to get a background check on as best you can. Then you have brother screen him to find out if he knows what he's supposed to know when it comes to the mandatory six and all the other things that he needs to know as far as the rules and regulations and how to conduct themselves as a gangster, right? So you want to do all of that. So you'll be surprised at how many uh, people that call themselves gangsters, uh, they know the business, but they don't conduct the business. You feel what I'm saying? They don't live it out, right? This brother, he knew his pieces. So he knew his lady, he knew the rules. He, he knew how to conduct himself, right? But it was something deep down inside this brother that was off. It was off and everybody knew it, but nobody really uh, could figure out what was going on. So anyway, this brother, unbeknownst to anybody, had been moved from compound to compound, and they he wasn't on PC, he was on administrative seg. And the administrative seg is a little different than PC, because on PC, when you're on PC, it's like you're, you're, the, either the administration is afraid for your safety, or you are afraid for your safety, and you check in. That's what you call checking in, right? But this brother wasn't on any of that. They had put him on administrative segregation because he was on psychotropic medication. So when the brothers had written back to the institution that he said he was from, they didn't get a response. It took weeks and weeks and weeks. So when something finally did come back, they was like, bruh, we don't know him, this, this, and that. But he was so smooth with the manipulation, he had gotten friendly with a lot of the guys. And they was like, look, this happens all the time, Joe. Can we just watch him and see if he's going to be straight and all this and that, right? And I wasn't in no tripping mood because it's a young brother. He didn't look like he could be of too much of a threat. And if he was a threat, we could take care of him, squash him like a bug real fast, and be done with him, right? So I was like, yeah, go ahead. We can do that. Let it run, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, we'll put him on watch. Even though he the business, we'll put him on watch and make sure that uh, he's straight. Make sure he knows what he's supposed to know and all that old kind of stuff, right? And that's what they did. You know, everything was running smoothly. Everything was running smoothly for a couple of months. And then all of a sudden, you know, like every um, month, a couple of months or whatever, I would always have the COS, right? That's the chief of security. I would always have him give me an account for, you know, all the pocket knives and all the things that we have that are hidden around the compound and hidden in other brother's cells so that we could, if something were to pop off, we could arm ourselves and, and do this and do that, right? And I was mainly concerned about 
the pocket nines that we would have buried on the on the yard on the ball field, right? Because that's where a lot of organizations bury their stuff. Because if something happens on the ball field, you got to be prepared to defend yourself. Because a lot of times when you go into the ball field, you either got to go through metal detectors or you get patted down. So you couldn't have the pocket nines on you. So you'd work it out a way to get the pocket nines on the yard, and that took a lot of doing. Usually you would have to go through other people that had access to the ball field when nobody else did to rely on them to get it down. And then once they got it down, you had to make sure that it was retrieved and put in a place where only you and your, your people knew it was at, right? So that's what we did. We had like 60 pocket knives hid around the ball field at this particular time, right? And, and, and the only people that knew where they were at was the COS, his staff, and, and, and me and my number two, right? You just didn't let every brother know where these were at because a lot of brothers are, uh, are too quick to want to go grab a pocket knife when the situation don't even call for a pocket knife, right? So here's the thing. When I had a CUS go do his uh, security check to give me an account for the pocket knife, he come back tell me that uh, it ain't but 45 pocket knives. Wait a minute, 45, then we missing 15. And that's a substantial amount. Because we got like 80-some brothers on this compound, and if something were to pop off on this ball field, we got almost just a little bit over half that would be able to arm themselves and do something. You feel what I'm saying? We needed all of those pocket knives because we was working on getting more. So, I tell him to go back and check again. You know what I'm saying? Did you check all the spots? He said, bro, I done checked all the spots three times, and they're, they're not there. So, I'm panicking now. So I convene, you know, all the tops, you know, me, my number two, the secretary, the treasury, and of course the COS. We all sitting around talking like, man, what is going on? Where is the, where are the butchers at? What are we going to do? How are we going to solve the problem? Because it took a lot to get these pocket knives made and then smuggled on the ball field by people that we, that are outside the oil and peons that we had to rely on. And just didn't want to do that again. You feel what I'm saying? But we were halfway down to the point to where we, if something popped off, we're in trouble. Half, Almost half of our guys wouldn't have a butcher. We were in trouble. And that's a serious thing. I know a lot of people might not look at that as serious, but in here, it's serious. You'd rather be caught with one than without one in most cases. You feel me? I'm blessed that I'm not in that anymore, but I'm just keeping it real. That's what it is, right? So that's what it was. So anyway, we sat around and we tried to figure out what we're going to do. So... The next day, I tell him to go get all 45 of them, and we need to find us another spot. Because it's obvious that we've been compromised, right? Obvious. He goes to get them. Guess what? They're gone. I freak out. I freak out because I'm starting to think that it's got to be somebody within the ranks. And the only people to know is the top people, the COS and his people. And that's three other people up under him, you know what I'm saying, under the COS. So I'm like, wait a minute, man. Are they trying to start a mutiny? Is this an armed rebellion where they're going to try to take over? Because you got to be worried about all that kind of stuff in here. At all times, people want your spot. And if they can't get it by politics, they'll get it by force. I'm telling you. So I'm thinking like, man, we in trouble. So now we're sitting around, me and the COS, we're sitting around in my number two. We're really thinking, man, what are we going to do? Because we can't let nobody know. We ain't got it. And if we go politicking with these peons to try to get them to make us a, a whole lot of more pocket knife, the word is going to get around. What is GD up to? And all we need is somebody in the opposition, whether it be Vice Lord, Blood, or Crip, to figure out, man, they they must not have none, or they're trying to start something, so we need to hit them first. And if they think that, then they hit us, we don't have anything. It's a whole lot of ways this thing can go south. So now I'm sitting there wondering, what happened? What are these pocket knives, right? So all of a sudden, out of the blue, here come this little brother that just got to the compound a few months ago, right? That questionable because we didn't get any information back on him. None of that kind of stuff. We didn't know what was going on. But what we didn't realize is that when he set out, he said, bro, I can help you with that. He said, you know what I'm saying? I know some of these guys up here. I can get some pocket knives made and I'll make sure that they get up here on the ball field. So we're looking at him like, me and the COS and my number two, we looking at him like, wait a minute. And you, who do you know? So he tells us these guys, these peons, he tells us their names. And, and, and my number two is like, yeah, I know him. I heard of him. I know him. I heard of him. So it's like these people are real, but we're trying to figure out where would he have met them? How would he have known them? And he had a story. He met them from another institution and all this. Man. We couldn't prove or disprove that. 
But it was like, man, well, we were in a bad situation. So it was like, so tell me what you can do. He said, I'll get some more pocket knives. How many do we need? I told him, we need 80. He said, okay, ain't no problem. I mean, quick, fast, and hurry. That ain't no problem. I said, uh, you know how much they going to charge? I'm already knowing what the ticket is. I want to see what he say. He like, no, nah, let me go back and ask. And okay, that made me think of like, okay, he might know these people, he, but he don't really know what they charge up here. So he go to them and ask these questions and all this and that. They come back, we got to pay them 25 for each butcher. $25 for each butcher. Either that in green money or dope. I prefer to pay in dope because <laughs> whatever I say that dope is worth, that's what it's worth. You feel what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, I tell them, yeah, tell them we we'll get some cocaine. They cool with it. Now, a week go by, no pocket knives. Another week go by, ain't no pocket knives. Now the third week, I'm getting nervous. All of a sudden, he end up, he got 30 pocket knives. COS check them out and count them. But the thing about it, when the COS comes back to me and me, him, and my number two, all along, he say, folks, he said, oh, I ain't trying to say this or say that, right? Because you got to be careful when you accuse another brother of something foul and you ain't got no proof it can backfire on you. It doesn't matter who you are, what position you are. When you accuse the folks of something, you better have your ducks in a row. And he said, folks, I ain't trying to say nothing. This is my number. This is my COS. He said, I ain't trying to say nothing that I can't prove, but I think you need to be aware. He said, man, them pocket knives look familiar to me. And I want you to understand this, y'all out there listening, that in here... You got to remember, we wrap things a certain way. We put tape on the handles. We put rope on the handles, this, this, and that. And the folks, we usually have a little tape with a little rope so you can get a grip on it. And bro was responsible for making, for making sure that every one of those pocket knives was eyes and marked a certain way. So that if they ever came up missing or somebody else ever ended up with it, we could identify our stuff. That's what everybody did. And he recognized those pocket knives, but he didn't want to accuse the brother of what he thought was going on. So when he tells me about it, my number two, we sitting back chilling. I said, look here, let's just hold up. Let's just hold up until we get everything we need. I said, it ain't number some dope that we're paying. We get plenty of dope. You know what I'm saying? Let's just see what happened. So all of a sudden, now it went from 30 to 45. Went from 45 to 60. Now we got all of the pocket knives back. Now we need 20 more. Week go by, two weeks go by, three weeks go by, month go by. Nothing new. No new pocket knives, no new nothing. But we got the 60 back. So now, folks, we still having a conversation. Me, my number two, and the COS, we're having these conversations. And now I'm starting to believe what he's saying. Something ain't right here. Something ain't right. We got back what was stolen. But it's no way that he would have known where these pocket knives was hidden. No way he would have known that unless somebody had ran their mouth. And I didn't have any doubt in anybody that was on the board. No doubt in them. So the only people that all of us agreed on was the three assistant COSs. They had to be the ones. So when we got to thinking about it and plotting and planning and trying to figure out how we were going to find out, because to be quite honest with you, this is a serious violation. If folks knew was running their mouths and somebody that just got to the compound a few months ago was able to overhear what they were saying about the location of our stuff, then who else knew? And had he done this before? Whoever it was. So as we started to investigate, we started to find out. Folks was like, man, it was one day, this is one of the assistants, he said it was one day that he was up on the ball field and he had told the other two assistants, look here, I'm going to go over here and check to make sure everything's straight. And he did that. And that young brother that just knew to the compound, he was there watching. He said they didn't pay no attention to it because he didn't say what he was going to check on. He didn't say he was going to check on the pocket. Line. He said he was going to check to make sure everything was straight. So we had to conclude by this brother being honest that he was telling the truth. And it's like... I mean, at this point, he knows he's going to get beat one way or the other. He's got to accept that violation because he broke security. So hands was put on him real fast. But at the end of the day, what happened, what seriously happened to him was simply this. After that brother got hands put on him, 
what we did, what we did, we figured out, okay, this other brother was watching. And he had to go over there himself and look to see what was going on. And when he did that, when he did that, he discovered that those butchers were there. And when he discovered those butchers was there, he went to plotting and he got them. He got them. But the question that we had is, why would you do something like that? Why would you do something like that? Now, I'm curious about who is he? Who is he? And we better find out real fast. So letters went out to every penitentiary. Who is this brother? Who is it? And we started getting letters back from the other institutions. Not the last institution he was at because he was never actually on the compound. He was in the back on the administrative side. And they said, look here. That's, they called him Crazy Folks. I said, Crazy Folks? That's his name? They said, Crazy Folks. I said, why do they call him Crazy Folks? What's going on with it? The brother is on psychotropic meds. This is what this brother does. Have y'all ever heard of Munchausen? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, any of y'all out there, if you know, because if I say something wrong, correct me, hit me up in the comment section and let me know. But my understanding of Munchausen, Munchausen by proxy, is that like it's usually dealing with mothers. They'll hurt their child, and when they hurt the child, they take to the hospital so they can be patted on the back and say, you're such a good, responsible parent. But they're the ones that hurt the child. Or you have firemen that will go burn down a building only to be make sure that they're called so they can come in and put the fire so they can save the day. That's like Munchausen. That's my understanding of Munchausen. And if I'm wrong, tell me what that's called. I need to know. Because at the time that this was going down, I'm looking at this. This brother got Munchausen. This brother's nickname is Crazy Folks. See what I'm saying? So now, I'm like, okay, we got our answer. This brother done got them pocket nines. And then he going to try to swoop in and say, look, I can solve the problem. for." He charges the dope. He done got almost two eight balls out of me to pay, take care of this. Ain't none of that gone. Ain't none of that going to get back. He, it's probably gone. You feel me? And then he got the pocket knife and he still lost 20. I'm sitting here worried that the folks going to get butchered. There ain't nobody finna get butchered. He the one got them. I'm curious now, where was he hiding them at? Guess where he was hiding them at? Because I had folks that bumped down on him in the strongest way. And you know what I mean when I say the strongest way. Go in and slap the shit out of him and tell him he need to be answering some questions. So they bumped down. COS sent them bulldogs at him. They went to get him. They went to get him. And when they bumped down on him, he said he had the butchers in the cell. He been holding 60 butchers in the cell until all this went on. I'm sitting there saying, oh my God. If they would have found them butchers, they would have got him. They would have came and got us because he's the folks. They know he the folks. They'd have got all of us. They'd have been thinking we had something going on. Then I said, how did he get him back down on the ball field? How did he get him back down on the ball field if he had him in the room? Because it's hard to get stuff on that ball field like that. This fool was strapping him to his body and walking down. And they, because of his reputation, the administration know who he is and what's up with him because he got issues. They weren't even patting him down. They just letting him walk freely. Now think about that now. They'll pat you down if you ain't got no mental health problem. But if you got a mental health problem, they just let you roam free. Now I'm not trying to say anything one way or the other. You feel me? But everybody need to get touched if everybody's going to get touched. Can't be no picking and choosing. Touch everybody. So now he's sitting here talking like I was just trying to help. And that's when I started to see it. That's when I started to see something off here. I see why they called him crazy folk. Something ain't right right here. So he's looking and he's starting to tear up in the face and all this and that. And I'm here sitting here saying to myself, I don't know if this is fake or real. If it's fake, what we going to do? If it's real, what we going to do? We got the pocket knives back. Now the folks didn't want him off the compound. Now I see why he's been moved from compound to compound. He's crazy. He'll do anything. This man done moved all the pocket knives just so he can come back and say he helped us out. In his mind, that was the right thing. But then I got to think, where that dope at? Where the dope at? Folks done bumped down on him about the dope. Guess what? He got the dope put up in the cell. He didn't even use it, get rid of it. I'm thinking that's gone. He got the dope in the cell. I said, man, go get my dope. They go get the dope and bring it back to me. I'm talking about it's still wrapped up 
and balled up in the knot that I had it in just like it was when I gave it to him. No problems, no nothing. But that's what I wanted to talk about in this episode. When you're dealing with brothers in here, you don't know what you got. You don't know who you're dealing with. And if you're part of an organization, you have no idea who they really are and what they're really about. This brother done come to the compound and stole every pocket knife we had, made a deal with us to get them back, brought them back, brought them back. And we didn't even know he was that dangerous. And I know y'all probably laughing and saying, oh my God, look at this, look at that. But that's dangerous in here. Somebody that would do that and go that far. And that's just a one example of the things that a lot of people in here do. I think a lot more people in here got that munchausen than they want to admit. Now, think about that. If you one of them type of people, you like to create a problem and then try to swoop in like you saving the day, something's wrong. And that's what he did. And then guess what? When we got to looking in his case, guess what he did? This brother did the same thing on the streets. The same thing on the street. He robbed his own parents' house. Robbed the house to bring the stuff back to say that he went out and found it. He didn't even take the stuff away from the house. He had the stuff in the garage. I said, well, how did they send him to the penitentiary? He did it to other people on the street. All up and down the street, he'd been robbing them. And then he'll find the stuff and then they telling him, oh, how thankful they were and all this and that. Right? He said he knew people in the streets. He could go get the stuff back. He didn't charge them to do it. He charged me. But he didn't charge them to do it. But they ended up charging this man with breaking and entering in these other people's house. The only charge he didn't get was the charge he had with his mom and his dad. They didn't charge him for that. His parents didn't want to push the issue. And that's what you got in here. That's what you got in here. You got a lot of people in here that got a lot of mental health issues that don't have a clue as to what's going on. Don't have a clue. And he the folks. Crazy folks stole all the knives we had just to bring them back so he could be patted on the back. My, my, my. Look at y'all. That's all with. It's all with. It's been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. Hold up, wait a minute. You know what? Stop, stop, stop. Let me make it clear. The reason I wanted to share this episode is because you don't know. If you're in a game, you have no clue who your brothers really are. You have no clue at the issues that they have, how they were raised, how they see things. You have no clue until usually when it's too late. But you will choose them over your own family. Think about that. At least with your family, you grow up with them, you know what you got. You know crazy when you see it. You know reasoning when you see it. You just might have disagreement with them. You might not like them, but you love them. But then you join an organization where you don't get to pick and choose who your brothers are. You don't know how they raise. You don't know where they come from. You don't know what they believe, but you say you'll die for them. For real? I ain't tripping because I did it. But I'm saying this to you because I want you to understand. Be more careful about the choices you make. Be more careful about the choices you make. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. And I say peace, y'all.